Bats and Stilettos. Why let's talk about black people in baseball. Why? It's like it's all over every single article you can possibly look at. Uh, I guess I'm about to go on the air and say anything. Check out little Dave Stewart, he would talk about it. Wow. Well, he's an agent and he is very vocal about it. So he would come on and talk about it. We just talking like Darren Jackson. Oh, he's in Jackson. I've heard him talk about yeah. it. I mean, you know, uh, maybe. You want to go hardcore in? But um, yeah, well, I figure we introduce this topic at 920 and just throw it over to the callers. We actually have a comment about it on um, the Facebook page already. Mm -hmm. Because you got to be specific because we've already seen, you know, different, you know, Netherlands, Dominican, they're dark skinned. <coughs> Black, there are dark skinned people that are playing That's baseball, right. so but okay. there's not African American. Why does that matter? People. Why does that matter? It's Seriously. Because technically, when you really go back and chronicle baseball, in the Caribbean as well as in South America, those people were playing baseball just as long as African American blacks were. In fact, blacks went to go play in those leagues because they could do it and they were not discriminated against. I don't understand why y'all trying to hate. Ugh. Oh. Hate Raise up interest. Like, you probably played baseball as what? Your dad played baseball? No. Really? Why? You just liked it? Yeah. Who made you like it? Because. I just what? Serious. Oh, don't say that. I'm dead serious. What? Yeah, I mean, that's right. The, the, the 84 Cubs made me like baseball. Yes, I did. No, I'm dead serious. The 84 Cubs. I just said, no. I, I got hooked on baseball on the 1984 Cubs. Okay, so who got you watching baseball, though? I guess it probably it had to be my father, yeah. Because to I, me, you, people who like baseball, it's a family. It seems like it's a family yeah. connection. My, my, my but family. I would watch it by myself a lot because, like I said, I find myself a little kid sitting there watching Ryan Sandberg and who else was on that damn 84 team? Uh, Rick Sutcliffe, Ron Say, all those people, you know. 84 Cubs. And then at 10, so you want to do it at 10 o'clock. I guess we'll see how the conversation goes. Not there's plenty of topics that are going on. Here. You've got Ray Allen to the Heat. I mean, yeah. you've got lots of conversations. This is not like we're going to be lost for our yeah, yeah, yeah. topics. We can do headlines, maybe. Mm -hmm. If we, you know, if it, if it doesn't work longer than that, we can do headlines. All right, so I mean, that's pretty much it. That's easy. If you love sports, then you'll love Stats and Stilettos. What's going on? Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON, Stats and Stilettos. Good night, everybody. What's going on? I'm Farouk Basir. I'm Maya Gavin. And tonight... We have another good show planned for you guys. Another great show. I'm not even going to sell it short and say good. I'm going to say great. What's this, going on? What's is, wrong? This is going to be a good show. I'm really looking forward to the topic. It's right before the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. So the conversation of there being the disappearing act of blacks in baseball big. Is, a, is a big conversation big. that obviously people don't quite want to talk about it. Uh, yeah, they may write about so, it. But, yeah. uh, it seemed like getting <laughs> guests for the show got a little difficult because people didn't quite want to talk about it, which I thought was interesting. Very, very. We're going to do that coming up at the 920 Part of the Show. If you want to participate in that conversation or any conversation we have tonight, 773-591-1690 is the number here. Again, that's 773-591-1690. You can also listen online at www.wvon.com, and there you can go and click on the iHeartRadio icon. Listen to us live right there, crystal clear. And you can also download the iHeartRadio app on your iPhone or your any phone, for that matter. And go ahead and listen to us online and take WVON wherever you go. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Stats Stilettos. And you can like our Facebook page as well. Now, so where's Ty this week, by the way? What is she doing this week? I'm not sure what she's off. It was a kind of a secret mission kind of thing. Also, so, uh, like some Mission Impossible? Yeah, she didn't want to tell us? tell us because last week, you know, when she wasn't here the week before, we uh -huh. made so many jokes about it. She's like, this is this is secretive. You don't need to know what I'm what doing. What jokes? <laughs> you know, she like, wasn't doing that stuff? Yeah, she's like, you guys are cracking <laughs> jokes at me, so uh, don't worry about where I'm going. But she will be back next week, no so uh, no we no will doubt. miss her this week. But that will be a good reason everyone can call in. You can kind of be the unofficial tie why she is missing on the show. So. Hey, cool. That'll be a nice little segment for us to do. Coming up, like we were saying a little earlier at 920, we'll officially introduce the whole MIA of um, North American blacks. Uh, people tend to, tend to laugh, especially um, Maya here, when I say yeah, use that know. term, North American <laughs> blacks, and, the, and their disappearance in Major League Baseball. Um, about, about 10 o'clock, we'll do our weekly headlines, You know, talk about all the different stuff we won't hit in the first hour, a lot mm -hmm. of NBA news, a lot of news in general in sports. And uh, later on in the show, we'll just kind of run our mouths. After that, we so. have plenty to talk about. Yeah, it'll be good. All right. Well, we're at the halfway point. 
Major League Baseball, the White Sox. I was out there at um, U.S. Cellular today. Saw them uh, take an L. But they go to the halfway point, the all-star break, with a three-game lead. Now, there have been a lot of surprises so far here in the first half of Major League Baseball. The Sox are among those, I like to think. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be the only one in feeling that way about them. You know what's really interesting in, on my Facebook page? People will go back and forth on this, and it drives me crazy. Uh, especially it, it, it specifically some Cub fans are like, enjoy it now because Detroit's coming. Well, we'll deal with Detroit. So Sox will deal with Detroit when they get there. And I think people lose you know, perspective of that. I mean, but I suppose if you're a Cub fan, you would say that because mm-hmm. when your team is not doing so well. The worst record in baseball. You want to you wanna focus on the opposite. So I, I understand. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to say this. Every single week in the conversation isn't going to change for me. My, my main concern with the White Sox, and it's great that they're leading the division going into the All-Star break. Matter of fact, they played more consistent baseball with an unexperienced, inexperienced manager in Ventura kind of leading them. But I don't think that's really surprising because I think what you're seeing more than anything else is those players are allowed to play baseball and they don't have to think about all the peripheral things, the arguments with Kenny Williams mm-hmm. and Izzy Smith. Those things have all now been tabled and they're gone. Mm-hmm. So they can just play baseball and they look like they enjoy playing baseball. But every week I say this, and a game like today is a prime example of this. If they're not healthy, if they don't get good pitching coming out of the All-Star break, there's going to be issues. They're getting the run support, but literally – Axelrod had given up two home runs that were three home runs in like before the fourth inning. He, he gave up two home runs and uh, two walks the first four batters he faced. And it's you, you can't have that kind of, obviously, pitching when you're facing up against good teams. Great series against the Rangers, by the way. Yes. That, that first game in the series that was 19-2 and two was mm-hmm. bananas. Yep. And, I mean, it's good to see that, obviously, they pitched well against a good hitting team. And that's something they're going to have to really do through the stretch when you talk about, because the AL, that's what they do. It's, it's good hitting. I always see the NL as being more of a finesse pitching part of the league. Mm-hmm. But if the Sox don't find a way to find more consistency in starts, not just from sale and just not from PV, it's going to be an issue down the stretch. Even though Gavin Floyd in his first you know, game back after assignment looked pretty good, I still get nervous with Gavin Floyd because I'm not sure where his mindset's going to be when he gets on the mound. Well, Toronto, like you were saying, they're a great hitting team, but – they won me over not with the 19-2 game, but the game the night after, the 5-4 to four game with Excellent Euclid. Game. Excellent. The, that, ninth, that last 10th inning, excuse me, was outstanding. The way Diaz, the manager, get that walk and then that great at bat that Euclid had before he got the hit. That's the game that really took me, I think, from rah-rah, like the Sox are doing great. So I really think they could go kind of far. I'm not going to say World Series, but I think they can go pretty far in the playoffs. Do you know they're the only team left in Major League Baseball that has not been swept yet? They're the wow. only team left. I did not know and it's, that. I mean, it's just an interesting stat that, wow, they're, and they've had a couple, you know, losing streaks they've put together, mm-hmm. but they've actually never been swept. Wow. So it's just a matter of feeling that the pitching is going to come together. You know, are you going to get a, a Gavin Floyd that stays healthy and mentally keeps himself in the game? You know, when Danks comes back, you know, like, like you said last week, that, you know, he was given those dollars thinking that he was going to be the, you know, kind of not necessarily the ace on the squad, but at least an anchor, yeah. so to speak. And, and now with injury, you're not quite sure how he's going to fit into the entire pitcher. So to me, it's the pitching that becomes the Achilles heel of this organization, and they're going to have to find the way to make it work. I mean, and granted, they've gotten some great pitching out of Quintana, which nobody, nobody saw, that it, it saw that coming. So yeah. at least it's good to know that I'm not saying he's the answer, but at least he's a possible solution to what could potentially be a problem down the stretch. Yeah, and uh, some other things, though, all the rookies they have pitching, you know, pitching staff, um, particularly in the bullpen with Matt Thornton pretty much being the only healthy veteran mm-hmm. down there. And then, like we were saying, Axelrod, who's been so – He's been kind of up and down, but Gavin Floyd, I can't, I couldn't believe he had seven wins now after yesterday's game. Like I was trying to figure out where the other six came from because I never seen a pitch like that. Oh, I haven't seen a pitch like that all year. Because don't you feel like you watch him fall apart more on the mound than yeah. you've seen him look consistent, like a, a quality pitcher? And I, and I think that's part of what I have to maybe dispel out my mind with Gavin Floyd. I mean, I think we all agree that he's a head case. I, I think that doesn't change, mm-hmm. but. Being a pitcher, that's part of what comes with the territory. You mentally have to be into the game. And you're right. I think I've seen him come apart more than I feel like he's been well put together. So hence in my mind, I'm questioning his ability to really be there for the team. And maybe I need to step back and say, okay, you're right. He's got seven wins. I must have missed the other six. And we're also, we've also reached that time with baseball where more people start to pay attention. Now, after the All-Star break, a lot of people really kind of start – paying more attention to the standings and say, hey, I didn't realize so-and-so was doing this. Like, for instance, the Washington Nationals, 
49 to 34. Who saw who saw that coming? Who saw the Pittsburgh Pirates, who haven't been good since Barry Bonds was skinny? <laughs> they have a one game lead going into the All Star break. That's unbelievable to me. This clearly has been one of those seasons with baseball where you kind of scratch your head. And there was there was some clearly some storylines, especially if you were a White Sox fan. You didn't. There were a lot of question marks coming into this season. I mean, you know, obviously Ozzy leaves, which I don't think. With most fans, at the end of the day, I don't feel that was that big of an issue. Mm -hmm. I told people it was coming well before it even happened. All the signs were there that he was leaving. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, you know, who would be the next manager? So then you get Ventura, which was really a surprise to everyone, a, a major league manager who has no experience, not a bench coach, not a first base coach, nothing. He had gotten to the organization um, in the minors. He was doing something that was more on an administrative level. Mm -hmm. So when he became the manager, and I, don't get me wrong, I, I like Robin Ventura. I love loved him as a player but I was like where exactly are his credentials to be the manager on the bench so it, it's interesting to see how that was going to unfold and there are times I wonder the change you've seen in them and is that him or is it just a matter of Diazza and Vicieto were supposed to be brought up last year and that conversation kept happening and it didn't happen so mm -hmm. now you're seeing pieces kind of fit in that should have probably happened last year it was pretty cool to see um, Ventura go ham today though you really don't see that from him at all he really went crazy and that um, late in the ninth inning, I believe that was, because they were, it seemed like the strike zone, you know, if you're into getting on the umpires and all that stuff, it didn't seem like it was being called fair. But he really um, kind of snapped today. Um, I was waiting for the umpire to throw him in the head like though and give him some noogies, you know. You know what's that's the last time you really saw him show any emotion like that. That's what happened with him. Here's something that's interesting <laughs> about the White Sox. And once again, stats, you can use them any way you want to. Mm -hmm. But ask yourself going into the All Star break, would you have thought that? the White Sox would almost have a player in every division in the AL leading in some kind of stat. So Paul Konerko is leading. He's not leading, but he's in the you know top five batting average. Um, he's third at 329. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got um, Deaza is run, you know, for runs at 59. Home runs, Adam Dunn, which no one knew what to expect from Adam Dunn, is third with 25. And then runs batted in, you've got Dunn again at 61. Think about that. Who would have thought that the White Sox would have that many players participating in key stats going into the All-Star break? Yeah, I know. Well, um, my whole thing with Dunn, he's got the whole quasi-triple um, crown thing working with the walks and the strikeouts and the horns. I don't know how to feel about Adam Dunn. It's just – I think I, what, when you got batters like that, you got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. You realize for as much strikeouts he's going to have, he's going to draw the walks. It just comes with the territory. But at least this year – some good stuff is coming with the territory was last year was I can't even understand what happened with him last year. I will say this, though. Does he not look at least 30, 40 pounds lighter than he did last year? He looks healthier. He looks like he's in better baseball shape. But he's only hitting 209. Yeah. You can't have your third place hitter hitting 209. Yeah. I mean, as good of a production as he's given the size, you got to be but better see, than that, that. But see, that gets back into talking about how you use stats. He's leading in home runs and some other stats. So it's like, yeah, we're used to seeing batting average to kind of be indicative to what we assume is top production. But in regards to being a home run hitter, and let's be honest, isn't that why you put Adam Dunn on your squad is yeah. to get the home runs? So do you, do you sit here and do you mince and you mince words and you get upset about the fact that his batting average is low, which I agree with you on that, and it's a little disturbing because we do use that to decide if we think a player is being progressive or they're really doing well. But he's also leading in other stats home run-wise. So it's kind of like – I and that's what I mean by it's like smoke and mirrors with him. It's it's hard to figure out what you think about him. And that's what I'm kind of struggling with because I kind of I'll kind of go back a little bit on what I said about the batting average. But I think my problem is he's not making productive outs. Like he had a couple of occasions in this game today where a simple ground ball, ball or a fly ball could have produced an extra run here or there they would have needed. So, but instead he was striking out. He struck out three times today. Like that's my thing. I know he's going to strike out, but give us an occasional productive out. Well, coming up after the break, everybody, we'll get into this um, North American blacks in baseball and the lack thereof. Uh, we're going to talk with Robert Qualls from TaylorMade Media about this and really see what's going on. We would like to have you guys' opinions out there, you listeners out there as well, 773-591-1690, 773-591-1690. Also, feel free to leave a comment on our Twitter page, that's at Stats Stilettos, and on our Facebook page as well. We have a couple of comments there that we're going to read during the course of of this um, first hour here on the show, so stay tuned. Stats and stilettos. Four is one, two, three strikes your out at the old okay.
Welcome back to Stats and Stilettos with me, Maya, Gavin, and we got Farouk's here. Ty is out doing something wondrous that she would not tell us about. <laughs> <laughs> and as we, we, we preface when we started the show, we're going to spend a portion of tonight's show talking about what I like to term as the disappearing act of blacks in baseball. North American, Canadian, and U.S. You know, so, uh, but I, I call it the disappearing act because I think <laughs> it's, it's becoming a gradual thing where they're fading into the sunset. Mm-hmm. And so that's going to be where we kind of you know, take a portion of the show and talk about it. As we talked before the break, um, Robert Qualls from TaylorMade Media will be on to kind of chat with us as well. So kind of let me kind of put into, uh, I guess, p- paint the picture for you of what's going on. And this is not a new conversation, by the way, Farouk. This, people start talking about this probably a good five or six years ago when the numbers really started to decrease. So mm-hmm. for those of you who are baseball enthusiasts, or if you're not, that's fine. You can kind of just kind of chime into this and let me tell you how this works out. When Jackie Robinson, which I think no matter what sport you love, everyone knows who Jackie Robinson is. Right, right. Um, when he actually made his major league debut, it was with the, with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and that was in 1947. At that point of time, um, pretty much up until about 1959, there was an influx of roughly um, 70% of the major league baseball became black players, African American. Some of them might have been Canadian based, because I'm going to kind of give you a lot of background this and you'll kind of be shocked how major league baseball really developed um if you're a baseball person you'll know that baseball became organized roughly in about 1840 and then obviously it it, it morphed and changed along the way and by the time you know you probably got to i would say about the 1940s it was more structured the way that we're used to seeing it Mm -hmm. so jackie robinson obviously broke the color barrier um began playing baseball and that kind of opened up the doors for more players to come in the statistics that have been have been looked at over the last several years is that roughly three decades ago um, baseball was about 30%, which you may say African-American at this time. And it becomes a more difficult conversation because for a while as a nation, the idea of African-American was maybe, how did you look at Latino players who still looked black? And they even said in the baseball report card, many of Latino players that looked by race standards black were actually counted into those numbers. Oh, okay. So that was roughly about 30%. Why it's like a big conversation now is when they did the stats for last year, they said now there's about 8% and they've really sectioned it out and said of African-American born players are now playing baseball. So you have this huge decline over a number, obviously, of, of decades. And everyone is asking, why has this happened? But let's take a couple, you know, a couple steps back and we'll kind of lay more things on the table and talking about population booms. And I'll even kind of paint the picture of understanding that Even after baseball was organized in roughly the 1940s throughout the Caribbean as well as Canada, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, um, and and places in South America actually were playing organized baseball. And a lot of players that decided to not necessarily play in the Negro Leagues went to those countries because there was less discriminatory issues and decided to play in Canada and, you know, in the Caribbean Leagues. Mm -hmm. So baseball has this very enmeshed history. Most people don't even know, like, Satchel Paige actually went to go play in the Dominican Republic. You know, so there's all these different things that kind of unfold it. But before we kind of jump into that conversation, we do have our guest on the line, um, Robert Qualls from TaylorMade Media, and we'll have him kind of jump in the conversation and, and share his information with us as well. Hi, Robert. Are you on well, the line? I am on the line. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming on and, and chatting with this topic that it seems like it, it resurfaces every couple years, but obviously this year is, is, is a bit different with the Negro League Museum being in Kansas City and the All-Star Game being there. It seems like the conversation has come back to the forefront. Well, I don't know that that's uh, that's the reason why it came back. It's it's also a cyclical thing, and, and as you as you well noted, there are African American players on every team, with the exception of the Cubs and the Rangers. Okay, so in your mind, from the, all the conversations that you've heard about this in baseball, what do you what do you see as the backdrop or the reasons for why there's been a decline in African Americans in baseball? Well, that's a good question. Well, I think the, a, a lot of the the national pundits have discussed this and. Major League Baseball has done some, some very incredible things in terms of RBI and Urban Youth Academy. But there are also some structural issues as well. And that structural issue is going to be based on what the families, what the family values are and, and their participation levels and the ability to be able to participate in, with travel teams and things like that. So there's a lot of different under layers that are socioeconomic in, 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 on one hand, but there's also a very structured environment where there has, there's not enough coaches available for a lot of these African-American young kids to participate and learn the fundamentals of the game. Robert, um, how you doing tonight, by the way? How are you, Farouk? Pretty good, pretty good. Hey, uh, I I have this theory 
on uh, the whole um, diminishing numbers thing. I think if you really dug inside the numbers and go back to, say, around 1986, if you could pinpoint a year, 85, 86, 87, something like that, I have this theory that I developed all on my own called the Michael Jordan effect. And what this theory entails is his rise in popularity dropped the numbers in Major League Baseball. A lot of people want to chalk it up to – it, people can't afford to play baseball. If that was the case, then where did all these baseball teams, where did all these black players come from in the 50s and 60s? Where did Willie Mays and all these guys come from? Why is it so much more expensive? Now, I don't really think that's the point. Is my point. I think the rise in popularity of guys like Michael Jordan, but particularly Michael Jordan, is the reason why we see this drastic drop in numbers. Because when I can remember when I was a kid, like teams – like the Montreal Expos, for instance, their whole outfit, they had guys like Warren Cromartie, Andre Dawson, Tim Raines. I mean, they're loaded with African-American players on their team. So it, it had to be at some point. That's what I'm saying. That's my marking point is Michael Jordan's uh, popularity. you um give any credence to that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that played a big part of it because, it, as you imagine, uh, Michael Jordan was a phenomenal success in terms of marketing the NBA in uh, the the, early, the late 80s and early 90s. That whole run they had while he was out there with the with the Bulls, that made some impact on on how how the demographics shifted from that young the young athlete wanting to be more like Mike, and the whole campaign drove that drive. And I think that had a lot of that had, had a lot of uh, impact on uh, the participation level as well. But even then, I mean, if you look at the All Star game, any of these All Star games in the late 80s, you saw a quite a few uh, African-Americans being stars of the game, but they weren't sold that way the same way that the NBA sold Michael Jordan in terms of putting him out into the, the mainstream and saying this is what you want to be. Uh, yeah, and I and Farouk and Robert, I think you're dead on a couple things. The way that the NBA markets its players and its teams is entirely different than how Major League Baseball does. Um, you will hear obviously about players in Major League Baseball, but as within the NBA, they really push a lot of players to the forefront. And obviously, the marketing of jerseys and shoes. I mean, it's amazing the marketing juggernaut that the NBA is, which in turn has kind of come back to bite them a little bit to a degree. Mm -hmm. But I, w I would definitely say, and one of the things I was reading in the article by, by J.C. Hampton, was that roughly in about the 40s and 50s is when you started to see a shift in the interest in baseball within the black community because that's when baseball came in, I mean, sorry, basketball came into play as well as football became more notable to people. So because now there were other options for, there was no longer like Major League Baseball had a monopoly on black athletes because other sports were pursuing them. Also at the same point, Robert, you said something. You can grab a basketball and go get 10 guys or girls, whatever, and go on the court and, you know, go play basketball. Pretty much with football, you go grab one item and you can pretty much start a game. Baseball is a little bit different. Like you said, it's a bit more expensive. You need bats. You know, you need balls. And if you get into the more organized side, because Farouk and I both played within Little League Baseball. Go figure. I mm -hmm. played in Little League Baseball. <laughs> but <laughs> it, you're right. It's, it's expensive, especially if you get into a traveling team. And I always tell people, the sports that are readily available in urban communities are sports that people will play, especially when you talk about basketball, especially basketball. You can start playing basketball, like what, in the fourth grade? And it follows you all the way through, through high school and obviously into college. Uh, football's a little different. You don't see more of that until you get to, to, to high school. But baseball is more of an invested interest that you have to get into when you're a child. And I think if it doesn't come, like you said, from a family interest, Robert, I don't think the, the involvement is really there. Well, I'll tell you one thing. My background is that I played the game for about 20 years. And I started playing baseball when I was about eight years old. And we, that's all, we played baseball, football, and basketball. We played all the sports all year round. But fundamentally, I wanted to be a ball player. And so that's what I, I decided to do. And there were a number of kids in my neighborhood that also shared the same values. They wanted to play ball. They wanted to be athletes. They wanted to be student athletes. So that's what we strove to become. And I think we were very successful at that. But, again, it goes back to what's happening at the home. Is there someone, if, even if there wasn't someone to play catch with, there, there was always a stoop in front of your house where you could throw the ball and catch it. Or you had uh, one of these these uh, snapbacks in, in the backyard where you threw the ball and it came back to you. Or you threw the off ball the into wall. the garage door. Off, off the, the wall. Or whatever it was. There was always <laughs> some activity that that, uh, that helped you develop a skill set that you would that you did be competitive on a, in a team setting. But we also had coaches that would allow us to shape our games as well. So there's a lot of different elements. In it, and I really don't want to you know uh, delve into what happened 55 years ago. I'm talking about what's happening now. And when I look at the rosters and the compositions for some of these major league clubs, it clearly tells you what the story is. Let me ask you a question because I've had sure. this conversation with different people, and 
I kind of get mixed responses from it. In your mind, is there an issue that there is a decline in blacks in playing baseball? Is there an issue with it? Does, is it that big of a deal? I absolutely. But, but I think what happens is when you look at the, the, the business of baseball, it's a billion-dollar industry. And so what happens is now you're starting to clean the game up. And you're right. From 1985 to the 80s and all the, the, the scandals that were happening, and then the steroid era, era and, and prior to that, the 94 season, that got half cut off. I mean, there's a lot of things going on as, as you start to evolve this game into a business. And this business model is now being focused toward more of a visual TV game. Right. So, And, for example, this is why you don't know if Fox is having the game on at 1 o'clock on Saturday, 4 o'clock, or 7 o'clock. So part of the packaging of this game is to present a visually appealing product that appeals to a certain demographic. And that demographic is going to buy tickets. It's going to buy merchandise. It's going to buy concessions. It's going to do the whole, the whole cycle of this business model. So you, you have to protect the brand. And when I look at some of these teams, and you can see the camera angles from these various broadcasts, and they're showing you exactly what it's all about. It's about selling products. And these ball players are now products. So if you don't have someone who is in front of the camera who can communicate to that, that audience what is – the value of that team in terms of how they present themselves, how they represent the team, the franchise itself, all that is part of that packaging. So the decline in African-American participation is they probably haven't identified those who can present themselves as part of that core of what this franchise stands for, represents. There was a survey done um, in regards to amount of fans that attended games, and they broke them down demographically. African-Americans made up 9% of fans that attended games last year across all ball clubs. So let me play the devil's advocate, Robert. If I happen to be Major League Baseball, not saying they're doing this, or I'm an owner of a club, do I invest in players and put on the field of people who are not in the the stands? Or do I invest in players and put on the field that are in the stands that people are coming to watch? How would you answer that? Well, I think this this will answer your question. If you have 600 ball players, in Major League Baseball, and 60 or less than 60 are African-American, there's your answer right there. So you're saying, as I'm I'm just playing devil's advocate, not saying it's right or wrong, so you're saying that despite there being obviously very few African-Americans that attend games, not quite sure about TV viewership, that there still should be a balance. Even when you talk about population in regards to African-Americans in the United States, Hispanics have superseded us as being obviously the largest minority group. So, and obviously you see more minority players, but there's a reason why you see more Hispanic minority baseball players too. There's, there's a, there's a method to the madness on that. And it's not by accident. It's not by accident that you see more Hispanic players and it isn't based on population. When baseball obviously was organized back in 1840, by the time you got to 1938, There was the Negro League, there was the Caribbean League, they were playing baseball in Cuba, the Dominican, Puerto Rico, as well as in Canada. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure if you heard it, a lot of African Americans chose to go to those leagues to play because they they didn't have to deal with discrimination. So when you talk about the love of baseball, it's something that peripherated beyond the United States, and people were playing in other places. So obviously once Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier and started playing baseball, Little by little, you got more and more minority players coming into the league, obviously, of the likes of Roberto Clemente, which I would say would kind of be a very pivotal player when you talk about Hispanic players and that movement forward. But it, it kind of makes sense, and I know people think it's a replacement theory, but I don't think it's a replacement theory to a degree. I think there's a little bit, maybe just a little bit. But the love of the game was already being played around the world. So I think it's just a natural progression. If you've got more black players gravitating towards basketball and football and not really playing basketball, you go to the next pool of individuals that are available, which in this case happens to be Hispanic players. Well, I think that uh, if you're in Houston, you can do that. Because if you look at the Houston Astros roster, you'll see quite clearly what their representation is about. Well, I mean, it's more figurative of the um, city that they're in is what you're saying. But I think at this point, but, but there's a trend because you could look at the White Sox. You can look at who, who is now on their major league roster. You can obviously take into account Miami. I mean, you're seeing a spread of Latino players, not just in cities that are heavily Latino based, because now there comes 
this this it could be a theory and part of it I think is true that those Latin countries are creating an export. Baseball is the primary thing that they export out of those countries in regards to athletes. They have training facilities. Now major league teams are investing in those in those countries to create more players. So the attention now has been shifted towards obviously the Caribbean leagues, not so much even Canada, so to speak, but because that is a product, even South America, that is being exported in larger numbers. And there's I don't disagree with any of that, but I think the focus of this is the African American presence in Major League Baseball, is it not? But it is. But I'm saying, as you have now found a replacement product, I think that's why you'll get less people making the investment in African Americans in baseball because there's now a replacement product. So well, let me share, let me share this with you. There was an, a, uh, a Hispanic sports writer in Houston just the other day who sent me a tweet, and he was talking about the new deal with the Dodgers sign the kid out of Cuba for $40 million. Mm -hmm. He was upset about that, and I'm saying, well, why, why are you upset about that? It seems to me that uh, that should be a part of whoever has the skill set and they've scouted this and they've made the investment for whatever reason. Shouldn't that be something to be applauded? He said they could have gotten 40 Dominicans for a million dollars each. All right, um, everybody, let's take a call here. 773 um, 591 is the number. Is it Raheem? Is that correct? Yes. How are you doing tonight? It's, I mean, just what I'm hearing is just various places. I'm, I'm going to take you back a while. Let's go back. So right after uh, Jackie Robinson entered into the league, he realized that after that period, you had somewhere around 46% of the players were African-Americans that were coming into the league, okay? You've always had this product, as you're labeling it, from overseas and around. Mm -hmm. But what was happening was a lot of Caucasian players, not only in baseball, but basketball and football, were getting pushed out. They were not being able to have the same type of competition that you were having. The best players are always coming from, from us. Our Sandlot ball players, they, they even made a rule years ago that you couldn't draft anybody from the Sandlot. When I say Sandlot, that means playing in the Washington Park. I, I, throughout the, the, the uh, league, you had players because they were diamonds. That it was organized baseball. We grew up playing baseball all the way from the Negro League. We were the best players. And if you look world. at it now, Raheem, you look in the league now, you name the top ten players in the league, probably a lot of people who think the but best player why? in the league is Matt Kemp. But Matt, why? But listen, though, listen to what I'm saying. I'm agreeing with you. Like, a lot of people feel like the best player in baseball right now is Matt Kemp. You have Andrew right. McCutcheon on the Pittsburgh Pirates. You have a lot of the best players in the league Correct. are still African-American and with our dwindling numbers in the sport. And my Welcome back to Stats and Stilettos with Maya and Farouk. Ty is out doing a secret mission, so she's not part of the conversation. But we are having a good conversation, talking about the disappearing act of blacks in baseball, that being American-born blacks in baseball. Farouk also North says, American. He likes to say North American, but it's really about American-born blacks. If you'd like to weigh into the conversation, you can call into the show, 773-591-1690, as well as you can post comments on Twitter at Stats Stilettos and the Facebook page. You can go there as well, Stats and Stilettos. So lots of different ways to participate in the show. We have Robert Qualls on the line with us from Taylor Made Media. He is talking about baseball, and we're just getting all worked up, aren't we, Robert? <laughs> no, I don't think we're getting worked up at all. I'm having fun. Go with started. me. Go with me on this. Go with me on this, Robert. No. But, but here's what I wanted to <laughs> share with you. When you include North American, African American, then you would have to include Russell Martin with New York Yankees. Of course you would. I, to me, I think this is really more a conversation about American-born blacks. I think because that's where the where the whole, you know, the, the root and the core of the Negro League came from. I think that's really what the conversation is, even though obviously, you know, our, our neighbors to the North Canada did develop a baseball league, you know, an interesting history there as well. I think this is more about American-born blacks and where have they gone, especially when you look at the likes of Jackie Robinson pioneering the sport and, and I, how we flourished at one point under it. And, you know, we've had some callers. And, and the thing I was saying before a break, Robert, and I'm, I'm never going to break away from this, and I know it's not a popular thing for me to say, and people get mad at me, but I, it's okay because I figure you don't get to the truth unless you talk about it. It's not about how much Major League Baseball is going to do. It isn't about how many RBIs you put together, how many youth academies. I don't academies. care about that. No, no. I, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. No, no, not you, that. not you, not you, not you, not you. No, no, not you, not you. I'm just putting a general comment out there. It's not you I'm saying this about. But I want people who are listening to the show to understand. If the people who are passionate about baseball feel this is something that's important that we need to address, then we need to roll up our sleeves and we need to get out there and create the opportunity for the children. That's the bottom line. Kids can't all of a sudden go create their own league and they can't go buy their own bats and balls. This is something that adults have to do. 
And if we're passionate about it, then we should be the ones that present the opportunity to the kids. I was telling Farouk, and this is kind of like a little sidebar thing, but it, it, it isn't just in baseball that it happens. It happens across a lot of things. I, at one point, actually worked for Girl Scouts of America because they couldn't find a single parent in the entire school to be a troop leader for the Brownies or the Girl Scouts. So they physically had to hire people to come in to do this so that the girls could have the opportunity. It's the same kind of situation. We have to create the opportunity for little boys or the opportunity isn't just going to morph itself. It doesn't matter how many programs is created by Major League Baseball. If we right. don't create the opportunity and take the boys to it, if you know, like they say, if you build it, they will come. If we don't build it, they will not be coming. And the numbers will steadily, it will decrease. That's just the bottom line. I think it's a simple solution. We need to be proactive and stop wondering what other people are going to do about it and be about it and do something ourselves if we well, feel that strongly well, well, about well, well, it. Guys, I hate to stop it. Robert, you know, <laughs> I, I love this. I love it. We got to do this again. Yeah, I, I love it. See, this is why baseball is king. is always going to be king to me, right? This conversation <laughs> right here. Now, we'll, we can't talk this long about any other sport. You know, but I well, I think we could, but yeah, I mean, let's do this again because I really want to get back into. I mean, I don't think we really captured what uh, what I thought the call was about, but nevertheless, I'm more than happy to be back on your show. And, and thanks so much for having me. All right, thanks a lot, Robert. We appreciate it. Okay, bye bye. All right, that was Robert Qualls from Taylor Made Media on talking um, some uh, real dis- disturbing baseball stuff. Right, uh, you know there something? Here. Here's what I think is interesting about. Well, hold on, hold on, hold that thought. We're gonna take this break because um, Malcolm keeps giving us the break sign. So let's go ahead and break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Stats and Stilettos. Headlines. Headlines. Extra, extra, read all about it in the papers. Headlines. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about some other (laughs) stuff. What's going on in NBA? (laughs) A lot of movement going on this past week in NBA. Free agency is is hot. Yeah. And a lot of moves going on. Bulls, silent. No, no, no. Not silent. Well, not. Okay. Is there anything that really excites you? Well, you know it's not. <laughs> okay, so I'm like, so stop acting like that move was something that's going to make a difference. Well, let's see. I can ask you a question, and, and maybe I'm just negative Nancy. That could be what it is. Okay, so the Brooklyn Nets, okay, going yeah. to Brooklyn next year. The big signing they needed to happen was supposed to be Darren Williams, the mm-hmm. all-star guard. Is he really that good, or did I miss something? I know he's a good player. I remember him at Illinois, and I was impressed. Uh-huh. I'm not overly impressed with him in the NBA. I, I just don't, especially last year. I just don't. Was it more hype than it, it really is? But maybe I'm just haven't seen him play enough recently. No, he's a great player. It's not hype. He's great. He's yes. great. Yes. He, he's a great yes. player. Yes. Really? Yes. He's great. Yes. Great. A strong We're talking word. about Darren Williams, right? That's a strong yes. word. Great. He's great. He's a great point so guard. So is he going to uh, lead the Brooklyn Nets to? Uh, NBA Finals? Depending on depending what depending they um, depending surround them with. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were stumbling depending, all over that. Depending, like, depending on what they surround them with. I don't, I don't like um, that they gave him um, the newest edition of Sleepy Floyd with Joe Johnson. <laughs> but um, oh, I think I um, if they can pull that Dwight Howard thing off, I could see that happening. All right, I'll go with it. I just, like I said, <laughs> I, I will say, I mean, at, at one point with the Jazz, I was really impressed with him, and it just seemed like to me the last couple of years he just hasn't been there. But maybe it's just been where he's been. Is that more of what it is? Yes, okay. that's exactly I'm, I'm what gonna, it I'm is. I'm just going to put it to you. He was with the Nets. Much wasn't going on. Hence, his production, just I wasn't overly impressed with him the last couple of years. But, yeah. okay, we'll see what happens with that. Okay, so Ray Allen to the Heat for a year contract. Thoughts on that? Is that a repeat to the Heat? Well, I thought even without him, I thought it was going to be Miami, Oklahoma City. I said that after the finals happened. We're going to see that next year anyway. I think this enhances Miami's um, chances of winning it again instead of Oklahoma possibly winning it next year. I think um, I'm not going to say definite repeat, but like I said, I plan on seeing them there in the finals anyway. So have you also had that moment where you realize that it's about to be basketball wasteland in Chicago for like what oh, a season I w- or two? I was prepared for that once Rose um his, once his um injury was announced. I was fully prepared for that. But I don't think which I criticize them for all the time, Bulls management, they're never prepared for anything and they're definitely not prepared for it now the way they're um approaching the season it looks like. How much do you think their lack of preparedness, and I think this has a lot to do with it personally, is that they always overcommit to players opposed to winning. That has a whole lot to do with it. I'll say like at least 
They, they fall in love. We talked about this last week. They, they fall in love with their guys, particularly the Bulls have that worse than any team here in the city. They just fall in love with their guys. You know, they're committed to not trading Noah. They're going to build with their guys. You know, it started with Kraus. It's not even just the Gar Packs thing. It started with Kraus with the whole Eddie Curry and um, Tyson Chandler thing. This isn't anything new with Chicago Bulls management. It might come from Ryan's door. So Seeing that it can't start it with Kraus, you, well, know, you know, I mean? and Ryan Sharp does have this thing about when he likes you, he likes you. Yeah. that is that is part so of. You I'm know, not going to just story. as much as I can't stand John Paxson as a management type. You know, I'm not going to just put that on him. I think that's a little bit over his head. It might go a little higher up the food chain with that. So when you look at, I mean, we could always we could take the Bulls out the equation anyways because we already knew that with the time frame it was going to take for Rose to come back from being healthy, it, it's not going to happen. Contractually, they obviously had th- their hands are tied. I mean, obviously with the contracts with with Dang, you know, with Noah, even with Boozer of all contracts, their hands are tied. They just they're at their cap space. There's nothing they can really do, honestly, to get better. Which is is really disconcerting when you look at how much the East is evolving in regards to teams acquiring and moving talent. I mean, Atlanta is like, okay, forget it. We're just about to kind of ship everybody out of Dodge to kind of redo this. So I don't necessarily see them as something that's an issue, but the Sixers and the Pacers are just they're getting better every year. And I look at how the Bulls are currently constructed. I'm like, they're going to have to do something. They should blow it up this year. They should have just, instead of going after hiring, they should trade everybody. Blow it up. Do what um, the Spurs did when they got Tim Duncan. That year that uh, David Robinson got hurt, mm-hmm. and they tanked it. They didn't tank it, but they didn't have talent. So they wound up getting the number one pick in Tim Duncan. Then two years later, they win the title. So here's a question. If you're blowing it up, what pieces are you um, taking apart? Everything. Everything must go. Every- Strip the car. Buck- e- ne- Bucky naked. Everything must yeah, go. Yeah, everything must go. Except for? They're not going to trade Rose because he's hurt. You need to say that because you're in Chicago. But they're not going to trade him because he's hurt. doesn't so matter, but you need to say that because people need to hear you say that. This don't trade Derrick Rose. Trade everybody just, else. Well, I talk like that. People get mad at me. <laughs> so I'm just telling you, you need to say but that. Yeah, everything. trade all of them other dudes, man. Noah, Dang, whoever. Gibson? Get, get whatever. All of them. Gibson, it, so Gibson isn't a difference maker. So the question is, if you're blowing it up, what are you blowing it up for right now? Because you're rebuilding. You're not going to win currently constructed, even with Derrick Rose. Okay. This, this Bulls team is currently constructed with a healthy Derrick Rose, will not beat Miami or Oklahoma City. Because the Bulls went through injuries the entire season. You talk about, even before Rose, you know, Boozer was hurt, but then Noah was playing. Then Noah got hurt, Boozer wasn't playing. So they never really played as a healthy five guys on the team. You're not willing Doesn't to matter. say, we believe there's, there's some talent, there's some chemistry here, Doesn't and let's matter. see if everybody is healthy, what it's worth. This team is currently constructed. Is not going to win an NBA title. Tommy, what's going on, man? Oh, I just wanted to say what's up to you, Farouk, and uh, is that guy <laughs> sitting next to you? Uh, is that is that is that uh, young lady's name, Gaia? Maya. Mia. Oh, oh, that one. Okay. Uh, I think he's messing with you on purpose. You know that's what that is. That's on purpose. Tommy, I knew it was you. <laughs> and I'm not even. You know what? I'm not even gonna. That's why I started laughing. I'm not even gonna entertain the conversation. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My, I, I wanted to see if you, you know, I figured I wouldn't get you with the first two, but I figured I would get you when I would say that one because that's, that's what happened with uh, uh, President Barack. But uh, I, I just called in because I, I just love you guys, and I just wanted to mess with you, and, 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 and I'm a supporter uh, of the show, even if I don't agree with nothing you saying, girl. Love you both. Wait a minute. What, don't, what have I said that you don't agree with? <laughs> You better be glad he got the phone call. He's gone. You know, me, when, when you tell me you don't disagree with me, you need to come with a structured argument. That's why you just bailed, Tommy. But that's okay. Oh, right. Right, before we wrap up the show, something we definitely have to touch base on. Mm-hmm. Serena wins yeah. her fifth Wimbledon. That's what I'm talking about. See, every time about Tiger Real doesn't have to win another major type of event to consider top of his craft. Well, in tennis, if you don't win another major event at top of your craft, it's kind of like you're not really ranked properly. I didn't realize she was 30 years old. Wow, I was like, wow, when I heard and her being interviewed yesterday. And still, yesterday. I mean, and, and wins a fifth Wimbledon. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a sweet deal. So yeah. she's still getting it done. She's outstanding. I was like, I was really shocked to see that. And then um, I was shocked to see that. Well, never mind. But you were shocked to see what? What? what, no, what? no, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that <laughs> because it's not appropriate for, for what we're doing right now. But I'm very happy for her. Okay. You know what I mean? I'm going to allow you to kind of lay out your, your – uh, your hockey knowledge since you're, you know. I love me some hockey. What about the whole potential rumor of Luongo to Chicago? Ooh, are Blackhawk fans going to like that? Well, I'm asking you. I mean, I thought I, I thought no, but it's not about – it's about winning. But he's notorious for um, 
coming up small in big games. From the Canucks. I'm yeah, like he's game. notorious for that. That's his whole thing. You know, he really, except for that game seven two years ago up in um, Vancouver where he shut the Blackhawks down to one goal. In that game seven when everybody thought the Hawks would come back from being down 3-0. They went up there, played the game seven, was tied at one. Hawks couldn't score all on, on them. So. This is my question. Is he an upgrade at that position? Well, I like Corey Crawford, but, um, yeah. Yeah, I think really? he is. I think he is. Okay. Because, you know what, I mean, I don't know tons about the Blackhawks. I yeah. just, I mean, I've, I've, I'm a new hockey watcher for, like, the last three years. Mm-hmm. Maybe longer than that because I was watching them when Hobby Bulin was the goalie. Nikolai Hobby Bulin. He had to love that name because that was, like, phonetically challenging for everybody. Yeah. Like, it doesn't look like it sounds. Yeah. And then when I let him go, I was like, well, how are they going to recoup? And I think Crawford has done a really good job. Do you really feel that Luongo is an upgrade for him? He's an upgrade, but he, I mean, Crawford is an average goalie at best, I think. Personally, if I take all the personal stuff out of it, I think he's just an average goalie. He's a great guy, but an average goalie. And I think um, Luongo, while the fans wouldn't be crazy about it at first, um, if he got him past the first round, which they haven't done in the last two years, I think you know people will love that. So we have a whole lot of thank yous. Thank you to Robert Qualls for joining us from TaylorMade Media tonight. We appreciate that one as well. And also, we're going to add that we had our MLB show. Yep. If you're interested in yep. finding more out about the RBI program that Major League Baseball has in place, we are going to post this information on our Facebook page, which means yeah. you need to follow us on Facebook at Stats and Stilettos. Also, can I add, we do our podcast on Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. It's at Blog Talk Radio Stats and Stilettos. So if you happen to miss the show, you can actually listen to it Wednesday night at 8 p.m., as well as it's now available in the i pod the podcast section of the itunes store yep yep, yep so, so all pr- all previous shows you can go back and download on mp3 and you can listen that way as well we are everywhere thank you to alexis wolfer thank you to tamir baker thank you to robert chapman thank you to malcolm rocco thank you to everyone for tuning in and listening check you guys next week peace out of here